my hypothesis cheating is an addiction when we successfully cheat we get to avoid looking less smart than our peers but like all addictions the short-term gain of avoiding pain results in long-term damage of bearing the guilt and shame of not being authentic. All the substances of abuse, whether they're opiates or cocaine or anything else, they're actually painkillers. Some of them specifically are painkillers. But physical pain and emotional pain, the suffering is experienced in the same part of the brain. So when people suffer emotional rejection, the same part of the brain will light up as if you stuck them with a knife. The Neckhart Tolle says very nicely uh, that addictions begin with pain and end with pain. So that all the addictions are attempts to soothe the pain. So when I work with addictions, the first question is always not why the addiction, but why the pain. A child is born, the child has two needs. The first need is for attachment. And attachment is contact, connection, love. Without that, the human child does not survive. Even an avian child doesn't survive. Mammalians even more so. But most so the human, because we're the least developed, the least mature, with the least developed brains and the most dependent for the longest period of time of any creature. So our attachment needs are enormous. But what happens to a child where the attachment need is not compatible with the need for authenticity? In other words, if I'm authentic, my parents will reject me. If I feel what I feel and express what I feel and insist on my own truth, my parents can't handle it. Now what does a child do with that? Well, if I give up my attachment for the sake of authenticity, I lose my relationships on which my life depends. Therefore, there's no question. What becomes suppressed is our authenticity, our emotions. And then we become 35, 40, and we don't know who we are. But the model we have is this. It's, I believe we have a system of education that is modeled on the interests of industrialism, and in the image of it. I'll give you a couple of examples. We still educate children by batches. You know, we put them through the system by age group. Why do we do that? You know, why is there this assumption that the most important thing kids have in common is how old they are? You know, it's like the most important thing about them is their date of manufacture. You know what I mean? Well, I know kids who are much better than other kids at the same age in different disciplines. You know, or at different times of the day or better in smaller groups than in large groups, or sometimes they want to be on their own. If you're interested in the model of learning, you don't start from this production line mentality. There was a great study done recently of divergent thinking. Now, they tested this, and they gave them to 1,500 people. This is in a book called Breakpoint and Beyond. And on the protocol of the test, if you scored above a certain level, you'd be considered to be a genius at divergent thinking. Okay? So my question to you is, what percentage of the people tested of the 1500 scored at genius level for divergent thinking. Now you need to know one more thing about them. These were kindergarten children. So what do you think? What percentage at genius level? 80. 80, okay. 98 percent. Now the thing about this was it was a longitudinal study. So they retested the same children five years later. Age of 8 to 10. What do you think? 50? They retested them again five years later, ages uh, 13 to 15. You can see a trend here, can't you? <laughs> now, this tells an interesting story. Because you could have imagined it going the other way. Couldn't you? You start off not being very good, but you get better as you get older. But this shows two things. One is, we all have this capacity. And two, it mostly deteriorates. Now, a lot of things have happened to these kids as they've grown up. A lot. But one of the most important things that happened to them, I'm convinced, is that by now they've become educated. They, you know, they've spent 10 years at school being told there's one answer, it's at the back. And don't look. And don't copy, because that's cheating. 
I mean, outside schools, that's called collaboration. You know, but <laughs> inside schools. Now, this isn't because teachers want it this way. It's just because it happens that way. The model of going to school to learn is relatively new. Before 1900, most children learned at home and out in the real world. In 1837, the state of Massachusetts formed the first state board of education with Horace Mann as its secretary. Mann believed that everyone was entitled to the same content in education. Returning from a research trip to Germany in 1848, Mann lobbied heavily to have the Prussian model adopted. He quickly set about establishing a statewide system of common schools, staffed by professionally trained teachers. Prussian schooling had been out to destroy the imagination. In every public library worth its salt in the United States and in every college library, you will find a collection of essays by a Prussian philosopher, Johann Fichte. Fichte said we have to set up a system of universal for schooling in which we destroy the imagination. It's a pleasure and a privilege to be with Joseph Chilton Pierce. Joe has been writing and speaking about human development all over the world and for many years. He's the author of numerous books, including his national bestseller, The Magical Child. What happens if this capacity to imagine isn't developed? The Swedish pediatrics group are the first ones to come out with the statement that the child with imagination doesn't resort to violence because they have an almost endless sin, uh, alternate number of scenarios within that they can play out, which they then know will have some effect on their external world. In The Matrix, there's a whole scene where there's a battle. And I would say the battle is between Neo and a terrified baby, which is, are you going to be able to change things? See, every time a person wants to change something, the, the baby that's afraid steps in and he says, I can't change this. This saved me. This preserved my life. You want me to change this? You must be crazy. And it's not so polite. But the question is, how can people with their pain? Well, only if they sense some compassion from somebody. So as another teacher says, only when compassion is present will people allow themselves to see the truth. So, Addicted people need a, a compassionate present which will permit them to experience their pain without having to run away from it. And all the attempts to run away, it's like another teacher says, the surest way to go to hell is to try to run away from hell. So you've got to be with that pain. You just have to be with it, but you have to have some support. <laughs> 